top off and that dude holding the noose, you know. Um, you got this peg leg dude, the swastikas all over the place. You got eight little things. All these are members of the club. And um, Dave Mann, I don't know if he was a member or hung out with these dudes or what, but if you look real close on the lapel of that jacket, that's where Dave Mann signed his painting. It was as if it were part, he was a character. That's Dave Mann right there. We did a self portrait and put his name on the jacket, even though he signed it, Ed Roth. So it's really interesting to me because Ed Roth was really a gatherer of artisans. And he was kind of the, the papa, the little family, and he would put this stuff out. But uh, he, recognized he came out with that Chopper magazine, man. That's Ed Roth, that's Chopper. I don't think he did a car magazine, you know. These are neat. These were, I pulled these out of his desk while he was still alive. And these were all, what he would do is his next catalog would come out. So he'd take a last year's catalog and go through it and go, okay, that one's not a seller, that one's not selling, that's not selling. And then he would take the same format, literally, and you can even see it, he would take paste, glue the new one on there and photocopy it. It was ghetto, but it worked, you know what I mean? So this was, this is kind of, uh, this is a, the next year's catalog edition is how it was edited. When, when he went through one of his divorces, the brokers just said, hey, just whatever you need to do, move, don't worry about it. Your desk say is just the same. I would pull these dress, these desks open. It was a time warp. It was like Roth had just left that desk and I would look at this stuff. What is this? Ah, he must have been, you know, editing the next catalog and oh, I want to buy that. Jeff, why? Bitch, to me it's history. Here I got a complete manual. I don't want the complete one. I want the one that's been marked up. Then you know it's he touched this. It's it's history evolving right here, you know. What uh, th this is um 1952 Vincent Black Lightning. He's got two front heads, all uh, lightning, the cams and the gearing and everything else. And these were they were you know dual GP carburetors and stuff, they really weren't made for Street used uh, uh, 49 WR, just you know, it's got the Flanders risers and just set up that it like it would have been raced in the early 50s, late 40s. Um, they're not terribly rare, but they're, they're pretty neat. Well, that bike got that from uh. uh that rotten, that's a JP Speedway bike, and um, can't believe that belonged to the received brothers and a father who were a race team. And that bike won a bunch of champions and stuff, stuff like that. Not a terribly valuable bike, but that's a good, really good problem. That right there is a DAH. Um, that, I, those two bikes right there, the black one and the green, are uh, Harley Davidson's racing history at its finest. They were probably six of those each known and um, they were made for they were purpose-built racers there's nothing on them that translates to anything that was sold to the public there's there's no making either of these bikes street legal everything about them is made absolutely for racing and so you've got this uh, overhead valve 750 um, DAH hill climber beautiful gas tank you know that never translated to anything that was remotely close to what the public could buy that top end and motor or like anything that the, uh, they offered to the public and then just to find one in nice original paint I think there's uh, there's one other one there's one or two bikes as nice as this one out there Dale Walker's got one and, uh, and uh, Jim Latin has another one and then that CAC right next to you that little speedway bike that too even though it looks a lot like a JAP that's kind of what they copied um, extremely rare and uh that bike was in Japan for a really long time. And, and this is it. I had a big rack on the back and all this kind of stuff and made extended the pedals slightly, but it's it's a stock. It's a 1914 Harley Davidson that's um, original paint. And um, the, the the bike came from uh, from John Parham, a dear friend of mine, uh, the owner of JMP Cycles, you know, or I guess the president of JMP Cycles and, and um, president of the National Motorcycle Museum. And uh, this bike took a lot more massaging than I thought. I had Lonnie Sr. help me out. Um, then finally, just went back to my roots and had my old man go over it. And he went from the front to the back, working for weeks, dialing as the greatest shade tree mechanic in the years. And it's, you know, I, I like everybody, realize that their father's flawed. But um, he really is a hero, this guy. My dad is neat. And um, he, he came up and just, um, 
really went through this bike and got the timing set, uh, got the carburetor worked through, uh, got the magneto charged and set, um, got it. I, I mean, everything about it. I, I wouldn't be in this run right now if my old man didn't just spend weeks. Of course, it's 3,200 miles, and I'll be lucky if I go 320, but it's the effort that counts. I mean, I did the trophy for the deal, and my, um, my philosophy on this subject is if we're supposed to be paying homage to 100-year-old motorcycles and riding them in Contra Country, like, like Cannonball Baker or something, I, I wanted to pick a first-generation Harley-Davidson. And so I went with a bike with, with still a crank without a transmission. A lot of the guys go for 15s because they're cheater bikes. They're, they're of a second generation, but they fit right within that clause of pre-16. So quite frankly, it's the smartest decision. But to me, if you're going to do this fool thing, do it right and go with the first damn year that, that, that should have done it. And then the other thing too is I've seen dudes with brand new tires, with new rims, they've, they've, they're cheaters. And those guys will probably finish the race, but I'd rather lose the race honestly than win it half-assed. And so this thing is just the way it is. The tires are, will wear out. Um, the thing will break down. And hopefully on the side of the road I can fix it with friends in the evening. I can dial it back and get it back on the road. And um, Hell, anybody can grab a Gold Wing or a new Road King, and I know for a fact tomorrow we could go to a Harley Davidson dealership and rent a Road King and go 3,200 miles. There's just nothing to prove. You know, your dentist on a weekend can go to surges with a rented motorcycle. Going distances on a modern motorcycle is irrelevant. But can you do 3,200 miles on a shit box like this? So why cheat it? I'd rather go three days into it and die a man than to cheat it with some modern technology and make it the whole way. Uh, you know, I, I'd rather lose attempting it honestly than, than, than win, um, you know, because I have a time machine. Yeah, you know, restored bikes is an old tart, you know? No soul. You've seen those old ladies that grave, you know, they, they just, you know, some, how many seven year old broads have you seen? They're just classy old ladies, you know? And then you see some dolled up tart that's just ruined and, God. You know, nowadays we're so used to turning a key and going wherever we want with absolute reliability. And when we don't have it, we use our cell phone and through the GPS system, the AAA dude shows up and we're inconvenienced for an hour and then they hand us the keys to our new rental vehicle. Life is so convenient. There was such a beautiful synergy between man and, and machine a hundred years ago when it, when you bought a motorcycle, a responsibility came with it to understand. No, no, there's the a lot of rich dudes that have, uh, you know, money that they can throw at these old bikes and, and they can get a mechanic on them and that they can dial them in. You know, if you really wanted to get a, a circulating oil system, if you want to kind of sneak up some kind of a centrifugal clutch, put modern tires, you really could make this thing. It wouldn't be the bike that was built by um, American Manufacturing Company a hundred years ago, but if you snuck in, four or five tidbits of modern technology. Like I said to you okay. early, I'd prefer to, to, to lose than, than do that, because hell, give me a gold wing then, if that's what we're doing, with a cup holder and a windshield and a stereo system and a butt vibrator and an intercom system for my fat wife, you know what I mean? It's, it's ridiculous. It's part of a, a, a you know, transcontinental race of, with you know, bikes like this, it's probably gonna be the only time there'll be some kind of organized event. Well over 70 signed up, uh, 50 are participating. The 20 smart guys already quit. By the time we get there, I'm sure 10 more guys will smarten up. Um, I'm sure two days into the race, it'll be down to 30. And uh, then I think that they'll, everything will be trucked until Victorville, California, and then you'll see, you know, 20 bikes arrive. And, you know, and five of those dudes will be for real. You know, I think Dale Walks will really finish it. I think a lot of the dudes that have, you know, these show queen bikes, you know, if it's got a big, if it's got a fancy paint job on it, who knows what's inside the motor? You know, it, it's it's all buried behind a shell. It's it's a it's a it's like a M um, and M. Hell, you could put dog shit underneath the candy coating. You know, and if somebody believes it, you know, you're assuming there's chocolate in there. But I, I don't know. Do you? <laughs>